hi and welcome let's just jump into this all right uh here we go so that was just me playing around on the sg there the 61 reissue a lot of fun that guitar um today's video is going to be a little bit all over the map uh I don't know how long it'll go, but uh, I want to talk about some things that we as guitar players usually don't discuss as much as we probably should, and that is songwriting and, you know, different ideas and stuff like that. Now, most people, when they're, they're most guitar players and stuff like that, they, they do tend to uh focus more on like uh technique and theory and stuff like that and you know just shredding or whatever it might be depending on you know if you're what kind of guitar player you are maybe you're more of a rhythmic player and you play acoustic only or whatever uh so when we write songs uh, you know from the guitar point of view it's usually a lot easier than like for example a drummer trying to write a song or uh you know, because we, we were able to construct the the melody of the song a lot easier, right? So bass players they uh, bass players tend to write a lot of lyrics uh, in comparison to the guitar players, right? I'm not it, it's not the same in every case. Like for example, Iron Maiden, most of the music is arranged by uh, Steve Harris, right? So uh, he's the bass player, so he kind of comes up with everything, kind of thing. He's one of those. He's, quite a brilliant guy uh, the other people that write I think the most music uh, is probably the keyboard players uh, they, they, they probably write more songs on average than say the guitar players do or whatever but you'd probably say yeah the so the, the guitar players you know usually even a, a like a vocalist you know if they play guitar they'll usually at least kind of get the idea down basic chords or whatever but write songwriting there's all kinds of videos on there of how to write the the number one pop hit and stuff like that and there's formulas that they use yes record companies use formulas to write songs uh and they've done tons and tons of research to say to find out what people uh you know respond to so the way they arrange a song you'll notice that whenever you get say uh, a record company or something like that all their bands tend to sound very similar and then you go to another record company and it's like all all those the, that label all those bands tend to sound kind of similar like you'll you'll hear uh because they use the you know like uh same producers and stuff like that like uh, for example back in the 90s uh desmond child you know and bob rock like these two guys were synonymous with pretty much all the rock metal bands at the time right and many other pop bands and whatever and that's why i think you know you get so much uh similarities between a lot of these bands uh, is that you you'll hear especially if it's all recorded you know like stuff is recorded in the same studio so you got 10 bands recorded in the same studio with the same producer the same sound engineer and the same songwriter you, you know what i mean you're probably it's you're just getting flavors of right so here's a band they sound this way okay it's got a female vocal and you know metal band whatever and then this band here it's a male vocal but the, the, if you were to look at the lyrically or whatever or take the singers and swap them from each band you, you, it'd almost be like the same band uh which is not a bad thing there's nothing wrong with that but it does get a bit uh, formulaic if that's a word <laughs> uh, after a while and yes you can use these songwriting formulas and stuff like that to come up with a good song but I don't think you need to go that extravagant I don't think that a good song has to be uh, like there's no secret recipe you know what I mean there, there really is no secret recipe if it's a good song it's a good song uh, you know how you structure that song you know to get the catchy uh, chorus or whatever um, I don't think it really works like that because you can you know like again your catchy chorus that has the same melody and roughly the same tempo as the next band's catchy chorus of the same melody and roughly the same tempo you know like okay different lyrics or whatever being sung but and you know slightly different chord progression but at the end of the day you know it's the same catchiness 
Uh, so it's either going to be catchy or it's not. And to give you an idea, back in 1992, I w went to L.A. And for a month. And uh, I was 18 years old, okay? And one of the things I wanted to do while I was down there in Hollywood and stuff like that was uh, check out all the, you know, like the, the Roxy, the Whiskey, the Gazaris, all, all these famous places uh, that, uh, you know, you know, all these rock stars and stuff like that. And, and I went to a few of them. And uh, how I got in, I don't know, because we were supposed to be 21, but I'd use a Canadian ID and they just kind of let me do everything. It was, it was really funny. I even rented a car, car with my student ID. It's hilarious. Uh, but anyway, I, I was staying in a hostel. It was like 15 bucks a night. It was so cheap. Uh, and there was a German guy there, cousin. Him and I basically traveled all over the place. I went and rented the, the, that little Chevy Sprint <laughs> with my student ID. I, I still can't get over that. We drove around with it for like a week or whatever. Crazy little, uh, cr crazy little thing, right? Uh, but uh, we, we went to MIT, which is right on, right off the of Hollywood Boulevard, or just right on it from what I remember. And uh, years ago, my first bass player, Mark, he had went to MIT uh, for, I forget how many months, and when he came back, he was just like, yeah, I think he went mainly for the summer months or whatever. And he went, and he came back, and he said he really enjoyed it, and they're like that, and, you know, he was, you know, I don't know if he ever became a bass teacher or whatever, he, he I don't know what he would have done with it, but uh, it was kind of one of those things, like any sort of music observatory uh, stuff like where you go and you become like uh, you know musician extraordinaire it's like mostly all theory right so if you are going to get into that it's kind of one of those things that either you're doing it as a interest or you're doing it because you're going to follow that career because it's, it's one of those things like how do you make money off of it after because like a degree in that there's very limited places where you can use like here in uh where i'm at uh like if you have like a musical degree you could, you might be able to play in the nac national capital commission you know uh, national arts centers or places right and that is like so few people that can get in there you know what i mean there, there's so few people that can get in there uh and get make any money out of mind you if you get hired on as like a I forget the name of the orchestra that they use there in Ottawa, but it's basically the NAC orchestra. You get hired out of that, you're making 20 grand a year, you know what I mean? So that's not phenomenal money, but it's, you know, for a musician, not too bad. And if you're one of the upper echelons, well, God knows what the government of Canada would be paying you. Uh, you know, like they might, oh, well, he's an artist, yeah, give him a quarter million bucks. <laughs> you know how it works, right? Uh, but very, very few people get to use that. So I went into the MIT and I basically, uh, Cousin and I went in there and we basically, the dean gave us a tour of the place and whatever. And I remember we walked into this room where there was a band just rehearsing in like this kind of like flamenco, kind of California style flamenco where it had electric guitars. There was probably about eight people up on the stage. There was bongos and toggles and drums and there was a couple of bass players and whatever. And I'm, I'm, I'm like 50 now and I can barely remember my name half the, half the days, right? And But this tune still stuck from 1992 to now, still stuck in my head. And it, it, the melody was... And it just, it just like, they'd do something and somebody would do something and then it'd go back to this melody. And, and we, we sat, we stood there and we watched these guys play for maybe about five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. And it was just that tune, it just stuck in my head. Uh, like forever uh, it was like because it was so catchy it was so well done uh and it wasn't an improvised fully improvised jam but clearly these guys the guy playing the guitar that he was playing that line uh he the guy looked like izzy straddling at first i thought it was but like you have to think 1992 la everybody's trying to look like you know members of guns and roses right so um it wasn't, but I was hoping to run into Paul Gilbert, but I never, I never got a chance. I did see Mr. Big while I was out there, as well as Michael Shanker and a few others. Uh, but when I saw Mr. Big, uh, it was with Richie Cotson, who, very, very good. The guy's a phenomenal player. A uh, bit of a bizarre character, but a phenomenal player, right? Uh, but I really wanted to meet Paul Gilbert. 
you know, I was hoping to run into him in the MIT, you know, <laughs> you know, like at least say hi to him or whatever, and at best maybe talk guitars with him, right? But uh, that 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 did that never happened either. So yeah, whatever, you know. Um, but the thing is, is that it's that many years later, and I still remember the line from that song. So that was a well-written song. I don't. There was no vocals or nothing to it. It was just an instrumental, or whatever. But it was a well-written song. Is the point I'm getting at? Uh, you know, again, if you can remember, and, and again, a five-minute tune that you heard in 1992. Uh, you know, for you know, like I say, five minutes or whatever, a lot and a live take. Uh, not knowing the song at all, but uh, and you could still like the, the the melody I just hummed to you there uh, is the exact melody that it was. You know what I mean? Like you, you know when you hear a song, you, you'll forget about how it goes after a while. But like this, it's stuck. So I'm like, I want to write a song that's that catch. Now, mind you, that could be a love him or hate him song too, because it becomes a song. Uh, like the uh, never-ending song or whatever, <laughs> like it's or the never the song that never ends or whatever. This just <laughs> just goes on and on, my friends. Yeah, it becomes like yeah, you don't want to be that annoying. But uh, it, it was just it was really cool that you could write something like that. And I remember just that little experience. Although it was eight thousand dollars at the time to go to MIT, and I thought, well, there's probably a lot of better ways to spend eight thousand dollars. So, uh, you know, like um, even the dean I think said to us. You know, like it's like if you're going to become like a guitar teacher or something, uh, or you know, like because like you know, you, you know, you're gonna about to spend eight thousand. Now, mind you, going to school for eight thousand dollars in the 1990s wasn't uncommon, but you could get an engineering degree for that. Money. Now it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think it's gone stupid, but uh, but the thing is, is that you you know, it's like you know, what do you do with this degree? Well, it basically. It was for people that would, like, say you wanted to open up a, um, a music observatory. You you would use that. You know, you'd use that degree for that. Uh, for the guy that just wanted to be a guitar teacher, might be a little excessive, but you would get a lot of knowledge out of it. Uh, but mainly, it's for people that were enthusiasts because all the knowledge you can learn at MIT, you can learn, you know, pretty much for free on the internet. It just It'll take and it'll take you about the same time. You just have to know where to look, right? Uh, you know the the knowledge is out there. Uh, uh, one of my subscribers was asking about me doing like guitar lessons, and I had like videos and stuff like that. And I had I had contemplated doing that for many years, but it's just there's so many better, uh, you know, guitar learning channels that I can't compete with. I don't have the editing software or probably even the skills to, to uh, you know, uh, do a really good demonstration of how to play things and, you know, with the tabs underneath and stuff. I, I, I just don't have the ability to do that. I'm just, uh, I don't even know how they do that, right? But uh, if I did, I, I, I would. Uh, the best channel I've seen out there right now is uh, Brent. Berth, Berth, Berth. He doesn't even know how to say his own name, so I don't feel so bad. But anyway, the Austrian guy, uh, more for advanced players. Uh, for the beginner players, I wouldn't recommend them because, yeah, you'll learn a lot of cool stuff, but you, you know, like, go get the fundamentals first. Like, start start with the circle of fifths, you know what I mean, and, and work your way up. And I think for a lot of people, uh, you know, like, writing songs and stuff like that, like, for me, writing songs is really easy. I can write a song, like 10 songs in a day. I've been able to do that forever. You'd say, lucky you. Now, here's the thing. Writing a really good song? Now, that's tricky. <laughs> but here's a here's a here's something that Gene Simmons used to say, was just keep writing songs. Like, write a whole bunch of stuff, throw it against the wall, see what sticks. You know, like, not every song you're going to write is, rather than try to focus all your attention on uh, writing that number one hit song, uh just write a lot of songs and maybe one of them will become a hit but even if they all come mediocre I'd rather have 10 mediocre songs than one hit because those 10 mediocre songs will reach more people you know, you know what I mean uh, you know and mediocre meaning like it's good song but it's not you know you're not gonna remember it since 1992 you know so a really good song to remember it since 1992 right uh, some of you might not even be that old, so. Uh, but you get you get what I'm getting at. So, 
for me, writing a song, I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to write a song, you know, what are you going to write about? I think is probably the first thing you should ask yourself, like, what, what are, like, what's the song going to be about? And for some people, and you'll see some albums will do this, they'll take a theme and that, that theme will have run throughout their album or whatever. And, it, you know, like, it's something that they come back to, right? Because it's like, okay, well, you make a theme uh, string of song, like maybe 10 songs, and each one is kind of related to the last one uh, in some way, although you're not playing the same thing, but maybe the, a certain theme comes up uh, throughout the album or whatever. You know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you think like uh, Pink Floyd, uh, you know, like uh, Brick in the Wall, like it's a trilogy, right? So there's three of them, uh, three songs that kind of, it's the same song, but it, it it's three different ways and it just comes out as the theme inside the song inside the rest of the album right so think like that the other is just, just write unique song unique song unique song unique song nothing to do you know one song nothing to do with the next but it does seem like a lot of albums or well now it's more like this the 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 cd's done the tape cassette is a bygone era. The uh, record is a bygone era. Eight tracks are a bygone era. MP3s are kind of a bygone era. Now it's uh, you know wave files or you know MP4s or whatever, right? And it's really like music. The way it's consumed nowadays is like people consume music from their phones, right? So everything is like that. So they don't necessarily buy a whole album. They buy a song. Uh, if they buy a song, you know what I mean? The other way is still old-fashioned radio, it's still, you know, and then of course, you know, there is music stations on TV. Uh, MTV used to play music. <laughs> I haven't watched MTV in, year, MTV in years, and, you know, for lots of reasons I won't. But uh, the point is, is that uh, you you end up with a situation where you know, uh, where's your music going to be played? Uh, you say, well, Spotify, all those places. And the cool thing about that is that you can reach way more people if you've got a following. The problem is, is, you know, Apple Store, uh, you know, all those places. Like, yeah, sure, your, uh, your, your songs get there. Like, if you use, like, say, SoundCloud or whatever, your songs will get there. But it doesn't mean anybody's going to listen to them or anything like that. Your songs really, you should shop it to your audience. And your audience might be, like if you're, you know, like online, it's hard to get an audience. It really is. But, you know, you keep, you know, promoting it and whatever. And you might get a little bit of an audience. But I think live is always where you get the biggest audience, right? Uh, so, you're an unsigned band uh, or, you know, artist or whatever. And the only thing you can do is just, you know, write songs and just hope, again, throw them against the wall. Maybe somebody will listen to them, maybe not. Uh, but there is a couple of ways you can get your songs out there. And I think the number one way to do it is a video. Uh, just because you got Vimeo and you've got, like, YouTube, right? And most people don't use Vimeo. Vimeo, you know, they might get your song from who knows how they get a hold of your song. And they'll put it on you know YouTube for you right and but you don't make any money off of it but it is good promotion so if you have your own website or your own uh, you know like your own YouTube channel dedicated to your band that that might help out a lot too because then you know people go there and they listen to just your music right and that's a good way to build a following but I think like videos of like your live stuff uh, you know if you can't make it to the studio get a recording of it live and if you know you can't play live then you know you know make a video of you at your you know the best you can at your home just to get your song out uh, if you go on like I'm on SoundCloud myself and I, I got a couple of tunes on there whatever and I'm on uh, I figure what the other one is uh, anyway I got a whole bunch of tunes there but like they just don't go anywhere like again you're competing with uh, people that bring a fan base versus okay here I'm gonna try it and see if anybody 
uh, will listen. And I'm doing the, I'll try it for now, see if anybody will listen. And put up a couple of free songs, you know, like basically you can listen to them free, whatever. And then if somebody wants to purchase them, they can, right? Uh, but the way I'm doing it is I'm going to structure it a little bit different. What I'm going to do is write my song, okay, whatever the song is. And right now I'm trying to do the keep it simple, stupid thing where uh, less is more. Until I get my drum kit or figure out what I'm going to do for, because uh, I want to do metal songs too with my H string and stuff like that. But I don't have really good drums, uh, like you know, programmable drums or whatever. So my other option is to, where I'm torn between is buying a digital drum package of some sort and doing that, or buying an actual electric drum kit, which would complete my a bass and a, a bass and a drum kit pretty much completes my home studio, right? Uh, and I'm I'm still recording on old-fashioned technology circa 2006 BR1200 and I write songs on that uh, but if I get the bass and I get the drums the nice thing about the, the electric drums is I can play them live it's just now I got this drum kit sitting there you know what I mean like you know like my room's already full of guitars and amps and stuff like that my music room so to speak uh, you know it's get, getting kind of crowded in there so uh, you know like a digital option might be a way to go but anyway uh, that, that aside, uh, I grab my acoustic guitar, I grab the mics, uh, mic everything up, uh, I record my song, and then when I'm done recording my song, I put the song on SoundCloud, okay? Now, almost nobody sees it, but so far, uh, the people that have seen uh, my a couple of my songs, uh, the one that I think is doing the best, it's got like 17 views on it. I know, I know. So what do you know? Well, why should we listen to a guy who's only got 17 views on his song? Because it's not promoted. You know, it's just it's on there, right? And but out of the 17 views, it's got like four or five little hearts on it. So it's like, okay, well, people like that. That you know, when they do hear it. So now, how do I get that song that the average person that's listened to it really, you know, seems to like it? How do I get that in front of 17,000 people, 170,000 people, or 17 million, right? Well, a video. <laughs> now, right now I've got, uh, like, songs that are, you know, just like really more idea songs, and I'm not really promoting, but you never know, like, you never know what people are going to like, 100%, right? So. Uh, what I want to do is make a video and it doesn't have to be an extravagant video you don't need really high sophisticated equipment to make a video uh, if you can't do any editing uh, I can do very limited editing I use Windows Movie Makers that's the only editing I can do right um, so if I uh, make a really good video uh, meaning, you know, like it doesn't have to be extravagant. Maybe you get a couple of friends together and you do some goofy stuff, or you're the band and you just kind of like day in the life of the band in the video. And it's not going to be a video that people, oh wow, that's the most amazing video, but it gives them something to look at while they're listening to you. And I think that's where you're going to get your audience because most people, well, like, the, you know, like, like anything. You know they're going to click on a video like this to find out information maybe they'll like the video maybe they won't that's not the issue but they're, they're clicking to get information you know like how do i get my songs out there and you think about how you consume music i consume most of my music now through one of two ways it's usually through videos 99.9 .9 of the time is videos on YouTube that's that's I watch uh, I look for bands on like uh, nuclear blast records I like them uh, some of their some of their lineup uh, AFM records Capitol records uh, and uh, you know napalm records I like I like the, I like the stuff the, the metal bands symphonic metal bands that they put out but there's other you know independent bands too and then there's just the bands that you grew up with uh as a kid like i mean finding new music now is like it's difficult but it's not it's just you gotta you know you gotta turn over a few rocks to find something you like right and i've been finding quite a few new bands and stuff like that but i find them through their videos right whether it's a live performance like nightwish for example you can find all kinds of 
phenomenal uh, live performances. Uh, Devin Townsend, phenomenal live performances. Uh, in fact, you you hear their live shows, uh, their live stuff before you even hear the studio stuff. Uh, and I think that a lot of people might not realize this. Like uh, these people, like we'll take Devin Townsend for a second, brilliant songwriter. Um, he plays live all the time, right? So he's making his money pretty much from his live show, uh, guaranteed. But what get brings people out to the live show is they probably seen him on YouTube or something like that. You know what I mean? So that's where, that seems where the, you should focus your energy is getting a video out. Uh, even the smaller bands, you know, like, uh, okay, they're not touring, they're not playing any place. Uh, they could do this out of their garage. You, you know what I mean? Like, like, you know what I mean? Like they can do a live, you know, like kind of a, uh, you know, sort of edit something together to make it, you know, something that people would watch or whatever. And you do see videos like that. Again, they're not extravagant, but they're something, right? Um, now, if you wanted to take it up a notch, uh, this is, everybody's going to be different on this. The better production you do, the probably the better you're going to have results. Uh, or if you like me and you don't have a lot of really great gear, uh, you can do other things such as let's say you get uh, you can buy stock footage. You know what I mean? Like uh, that that's an option. I just thought of that there now. But you can buy stock footage and, and put your video to the stock footage and edit it however you want. So you almost don't have to. Uh, worry about uh, you know you can't get this extravagant thing or that extravagant thing the other thing is you can hire somebody to make a video for you you know what I mean like okay here I'll give you the music and this is kind of the parameters of what I want make me a video <laughs> you know what I mean um, I've got a couple of video concepts I, it's it's winter right now and I'm not gonna be able to film probably till spring another month and a half or so away uh, but I got like a, a song I call Hammering of the Gods that I just wrote on my 8th string and I need the drums to finish the song but when I do I'm going to put it to a video that's going to be very very simple but very very uh, you know very very interesting I watched a, a, a video last night uh, I forget what the band name I forget exactly what which was Napalm Records or uh, uh, nuclear blast workers. It was one of the two, right? Or AFM or whatever. Uh, one of the, one of one of the three, anyway. And it was just this lady like singing, okay. And they they had all kinds of different, you know, camera angles and stuff like that. And she's basically just. Uh, and I noticed a lot of the symphonic metal bands do this. It's probably because it's 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 a cheap, uh, a, a cheap thing, a cheap a way to keep it cheap. Right? Is there is this lady in a blue dress basically singing while she's walking through the forest? She's got a bit of a costume on or whatever, and you know they get her at different camera angles, and it, it's it's like it's really really simple. You know, the editing is good here like that, and and you watch it, and you realize you know okay, what did I just watch? Okay, I was listening to some good music. Okay, and just basically it's just lady walking around singing, <laughs> you know, in the forest. Like I mean pretty simple concept but boy you know like it like it you, you're you're watching her and the way they film it it's like you're she's on an adventure or something like that but it's really just her walking through the forest singing <laughs> you know like it like when you think about it it's like actually quite brilliant i'm like yeah so you don't have to go extravagant and again no special effects or nothing you know i mean just camera angles just camera angles right so i thought about doing something like that too uh but Again, what's a, I, I, for the Hammering of the Gods tune, I, I, I want to get that one out. That one I think people are going to like because it, it's very simple. It's a bit operatic, but it's not a complicated. There's like hardly any lyrics in the song. It's more instrumental uh, with a bit of like a, like I say, an operatic ending, uh, which sounds really, really kick ass cool. And when I get that recorded, whatever, when I put it out there, okay, people will listen to it and say, oh, this strong is structured this way oh it's maybe they should have structured structured it that way you should have used this formula you should have used that formula, and you'll get that too but at the end of the day it's like well do you like the tune or not i was like yeah it's pretty cool too <laughs> you, you know what I mean? oh it's, it's structurally wrong and you did, did do this right you didn't oh that's predictable oh you should have done this instead and you should have done that do you like it yeah it's good <laughs> you know what I mean? and that's all that really matters uh if it sounds good it is good you know what i mean and um 
I've got another tune that it's going to be really, really epic. Uh, I can't wait to play it live, even if there's no band there. And I'm writing these songs, uh, just to give you an idea, on the eight string. The eight string is just it, it's the it's the it's the the gift horse. It's the gift horse. You know what I mean? Or maybe not the gift horse, but the cash cow. Like it, it, it just keeps on giving, right? Uh, and I write just that extra two strings makes me write songs differently. And I've got this one that I'm calling. Uh, comet into supernova and it's like this epic journey and again there's a little bit of an operatic thing at the end and that's the third song i've written with the eight string i'm like okay well i need the drums to, to finish it up and the bass i can i can deal with the bass thing and when i get this song done i want to put them to, to videos right and the, the the idea is that again getting back to the songwriting and stuff like that you write the song and then put it to something you know what i mean if you write the song and you put it to something or like I say, get get yourself playing you and your band or yourself or whatever playing it live. The problem is with us one you know like multi instrumentalist one man band things is when you go to play live like where's the band? <laughs> like that's the hard part. The, like getting people together is really really difficult. But it doesn't mean you can't perform it live acoustically or whatever. You know like take your metal song and perform it acoustically. Uh, so anyway, this uh, Comet into Supernova one would be awesome if there was an animation, and you know maybe I'll have to talk to somebody who's good at animation, saying, look, this is the theme I want. But here's the thing: there's three songs I got with the eight string right now, four, five I've written, uh, but three that are okay, almost complete. Okay, and, I, and I've been working on the songs for a couple of months, you know, or since I've had the eight string, right? Now that I'm starting to get really co uh, comfortable with the eight string, I'm writing songs with the eight string in mind. Uh, but I have one called Journey of the Intergalactic Inch Space Worm. Yeah, yeah, I, I like titling my songs for something really stupid and bizarre. Uh, but that's that song is like, okay, that would obviously some sort of a cartoon animation if you, you would have to pay somebody to do this and you find you know so maybe you go on like a fiber or something like that and say hey here's the kind of video i want who can make something like that and you'd be be surprised at what you might come up with uh you know maybe just okay short little bit maybe 20 seconds of clips you know that you just keep looping into your video or whatever or whatever it might be uh and it could be really really simple you know what I mean? Like think like South Park kind of, kind of like animation or whatever. Uh, or if you want to, if you can pay more or whatever. Let's say you had to pay a thousand dollars to get like a really masterfully put video. That would be awesome. You know what I mean? But it's a thousand dollars, right? So who has a thousand bucks? I don't. Um, but if you had the audience and you knew it was going to pay, you get that video and you know people are going to watch the video because the video is entertaining, right? So they're listening to the music, they like your music, and they'll listen to more because they like your music, but they're, they're watching the video because it's entertaining. Now you can monetize that, you know what I mean? So that's a way to kind of recoup that if you can, you know, if you can get the views. But let's say you're starting off at ground zero, you don't have an audience, you don't have, uh, you know, hardly any equipment or whatever. The, the simplest thing to do when writing songs, if you want to get them out there, if you're not playing live, uh, or you you know have a limited ability to play live, meaning there's not a lot of places for you to play, the video is still the best way to get your song out there. It's it's still the best medium out there. Um, so what I would do, and what I have been doing, is like when I go play the jam nights, for example, I record myself live. You know what I mean? And you know sometimes it's not the best take, whatever, but sometimes it, it does turn out very well you know and when it does it's cool when the audience there's an audience there right so yeah if you start doing stuff like that that might get you a little bit you know a little bit of promotion right which can maybe again help you in the sense of getting a fan base uh the other thing is okay well you want perfect takes of everything well chances are if you're going to do perfect takes of stuff you're not going to be playing live you're going to be in a room somewhere uninterrupted uh you could set it up like a like a bit of a sound stage you know in the corner of a room somewhere make it look like a sound stage you know put it like a drop sheet in the background or whatever play in front of it 
and you know just record yourself with the camera get the best audio you can and go from there and just do the best performance of that whatever song you're doing whether it's yours or somebody else for me uh, I think that's the easiest way to start you know and then when you do write your songs one thing you want to do when you write your songs is before you release them uh, is to copyright them now one way you can get around this and again I'm not an expert on this part but uh, I remember years ago uh, you could go into SoCan if you're a Canadian. You can go SoCan is a, basically you could go copyright your own. Like you, you'd basically get a news clipping from the paper from that day uh, and your CD or whatever you had, and you you put it in an envelope, you sealed it, and then you you basically dated everything like that. And then when you copyrighted it, you'd open it with in front of a I guess a legal representative. And then say, yeah, this is your music, blah, blah, blah. So look at copyright stuff for sure for your songs, maybe even before you release them. Um, if it's a, a mediocre song, chances are no one's going to steal it from you. But if it's a really good song, chances are somebody can steal it from you. But that, that that's probably less likely to happen. What's more likely to happen is if you have a really good song and it's starting to get real popular and it sounds too much like somebody else, uh, you get sued for plagiarism. I don't know why people do this, but they do this. I mean, it's different if somebody's ripping somebody off, like exactly ripping somebody off, right? Uh, then, yeah, you can kind of see it, but, you know, you do have to kind of protect yourself there. So it's one of those things, another topic for another time. But, uh, you know, like just, you know, write simple songs at the beginning and then don't worry about writing the, you know, the number one hit right away because... I think people focus too hard on that and then they get writer's block. For me, I never get writer's block because I keep it simple. Uh, and then my simple stuff that I write, okay, like say you wrote your song, okay, today, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to go record it. Well, record the idea so you don't forget it, right? But the song you write today, okay, uh, practice it until you know it perfectly. I can guarantee you in three months, it's not the same song anymore. You know, like uh, if you have, if you, you know, like if you're like me and you're kind of like, uh, you know, laid up for the winter anyway, um, one of the things you can do is just the songs you write, just keep working on them because you'll, you'll, you'll change things over time on them and or add things or take things away or whatever. And I find what happens is that the song that started out really simply and you just wrote it really simply and really quick. Uh, you might change a lyric, you might come up with an extra line, you might come up with an extra bridge piece, whatever it might be. Uh, if you give it a little bit of time, you, you tend to add things to it. Uh, it's kind of like making a cake, right? Like, so consider the basic song, the cake. And then now it's, you know, over time, you're going to add the icing and the sprinklings and other toppings and whatever. And then once you're satisfied with it, record it, move on, maybe make three or four versions of the song. Uh, make a country version of it, a metal version of it, or whatever, and see what sticks, right? You, you can, you know, that's the nice thing about, uh, you know, music is you can do whatever you want with it. But that's one of the things that I've noticed for myself that seems to help me with my songwriting, even though my, you know, I don't have a lot of songs out there. And it takes me a while to get them out because, uh, you know, getting the time to record them, you know, like I, I don't have a studio. I just have, you know, you know, like a room, like everybody else, you know, and you know, when when I'm recording, it's like, uh, you know, the acoustic stuff. I need basically no no nobody in the house. The dog can't bark, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, you, you know, and again, it done it. I don't always get that time to do it, but when I do, I usually end up, uh, you know, recording something. Sometimes you, you record it about five times and. It's like, ah, nah, I, I got to do it again, got to do it again, got to do it again. So it does take a process to get it down. But just keep playing those songs until you get the chance to record them. And then maybe do a live take of it. Uh, one of the things I do now is once I got a song down that I'm really happy with it, uh, you know, enough to showcase it, even as a basic idea, what I do is I, well, Obviously, I'm going to wait till the jam nights start up again, but I'm going to, I go to the jam nights or whatever. I play it live and record it while I'm playing it live. So here's my original song, then here's two covers, right? Do that. 
Now, let's say I'm playing a gig. Well, I'll probably say throw one or two original songs per set. Uh, that's what we used to do in my old band. Uh, you know, back in the '90s, was uh, we we had about eight or ten original tunes, and you know, we'd play three hours a night. So we kind of, you know, we never tell the bartender that we're doing that. But then, you know, like here's one of ours, and then we just play it, right? Because a lot of th- a lot of places they didn't want you to play original music because it, it was too much of a gamble, right? So like they might get somebody that's really really good, and it's all okay, it's all original music, and it's really really good. But then they might get somebody going in there doing deathcore, right? So and then a lot of places. You know, nothing against deathcore myself, but uh, a lot of places don't like that kind of music. <laughs> you know, I mean, like you, you can't get away with it. So, writing songs, if you're 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 really really struggling and stuff like that, just think simple. Like, uh, if you have to start with just like a three chord song, whatever, do that. Do simple progressions, simple everything. Get the idea down, and then add to that idea. I find that works best. And if you find you're writing the same song all the time a really cool trick especially for you acoustic players uh, you can do this with the electrics too but if you want to kind of get like a new perspective on playing uh tune your guitar into different tunings you know like uh, dad gad tuning that kind of stuff uh that i find just brings out such creativity because it's a new sound and it, it, it just kind of intuitively makes you explore it uh it's kind of like what i'm experiencing with the uh, the h string right now it's just that you know, like that kind of different sound. Uh, I don't play the eight string the way I play my regular six string. You know what I mean? Like I, I it's it's just a different animal. Uh, but to make things more musical and melodic and whatever, uh, you know, like you come up with the like I say the basic song, basic lyrics, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, whatever. Could be that predictable. Now, most people say don't write a song like that because that's, you know, like you'll never stand out or whatever because that formula has been done for, well, forever and a day. Like you think from like the 1950s to now, pretty much any sort of rock and roll based song is, you know, intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, solo, chorus, outro, whatever, some sort of thing like that. Now, if you look at pop music and stuff like that, it's... Some of it will start in on a chorus, uh, and then there'll be like this little kind of uh, bridge piece to another, like kind of like a like a pre-chorus, second pre-chorus, and then a chorus, and then like a an alternate chorus, and then a, a verse, and then a, a pre-chorus, and then a bridge, and then a chorus. You know, and it doesn't follow a normal formula, right? Of of just first chorus, first chorus. And that works to a degree as well. And then you get stuff like, uh, say, like Nightwish. I use them a lot as uh, because that is like, uh, you know, like the course is just the theme that they run back to, where they do key changes, they do all kinds of crazy stuff throughout a song. If you want to hear an extremely epically written song, it's Ghost Love Score. I highly recommend if you want to if you want to do a reaction video for yourself. Uh, it's go to uh, walk in 2013 this specific video walk in 2013 the uh, ghost love score with Thor Jansen singing uh, any version of the song is good but I think that's the best one out there and it's live and it is so epically good the first time I heard it I was just I was blown away but it's all the crazy changes in there just listen to all the different uh, you know changes like it's just all these weird time signatures and just these, you know, the song goes this direction, then that direction. And it's just brilliant songwriting. Um, but yet it doesn't fall apart and it doesn't seem like it falls out of, uh, out of theme where sometimes, uh, you know, people will do that. They'll write a song and they'll just try to get too, uh, too contrasting. You know, so it's like going to make this and then turn it into this and then turn it into this and then turn it into this. And it, and people just lose, uh, you know, like lose, uh, you know, the tempo change kind of throws you off. And then uh, it goes to a normal tempo, then an oddball tempo, and then a high, high speed, low speed, uh, first chorus, uh, pre-chorus, second solo, <laughs> you know, like, and it, it just gets so confusing that people can't get into it. So... 
when you're looking at like studying like people like how to write a, a number one song uh, everybody's going to take that uh, that that kind of formula and they're going to try it right and then suddenly everybody's doing it suddenly everybody's going to sound the same right so I'm not saying don't look at stuff like that obviously look at it because it's interesting but what I'd look at more is just focus you know instead of focusing on you know how do I make the song a number one hit uh, just focusing on is it a good song <laughs> you know you know like is this a song that I myself would listen to more than once and when I play my songs okay uh, and I'll record a song whatever and I'll do like a demo on it it's like okay that's fun and then I don't play that song anymore. well that's probably not that great of a song you know what I mean where if there's a song that's like, oh, I'm going to play it, but I'm going to try it this way this time. I'm going to try it that way. That, and I'm starting to get into it. It's like, okay, yeah, I can't wait to play this song for people. Then you know you got something. Well, you know, like if you if you won't even listen to your own songs, uh, then, you know, and, and I'm one of those people, like I'll write something I just, okay, it's done. It wouldn't matter how epic it is. Uh, I, I probably would okay yeah but I'm gonna move on and write something else so I don't listen to the song because of that but when I do hear my own song do I like it you know what I mean and there's a couple of songs that I'm like yeah I like that you know like that that song's fun to play live okay you know like uh, you know if I had to go on tour and play this song every night kind of thing yeah it wouldn't be a bad song you know what I mean like uh, my Atlas song I really like that one that one uh, the first time I played it live, uh, the audience reacted very, very well to it. I kind of figured they would because of that crazy little riff in the middle of the song. Uh, it, it uh, even if you know, like it's not the most impressive song, but it's just it's a very riff-oriented song on the twelve string, and it, it just sounds cool. And that little riff thing that I do in the middle of it, uh, you know, I've had a couple of guitar players tell me like, "Yeah, that that's really cool." You know, what I mean, like that that's you know because you just don't hear that right so it's something unique and it's basically verse uh, uh, verse verse little crazy little uh, wiggly diddly thing in the middle of the song verse outro and it, there's it, there, there's there's no course in the song you know, uh, you know, so like the song is called Atlas, but there's no chorus in the song, and it like who writes a song with no chorus? You know, what I mean, like that, like that, that's very unique, isn't it? You know what I mean? Like, because I thought about it after, like I listened to the song, I was like, there's something weird about this song that makes it so good, and then it realizes like there's no chorus in this song; it is completely chorus-free. And it's like, okay, that might be a different way. Like, wh where did it get stapled in that you have to have a chorus in the song? You, you know what I mean? Like, you'd say, yeah, but that your your chorus is your hook. It's it's your it's what drags people into it, not necessarily, because storytelling is another big part of your song. Uh, I have a, a song that I wanted to work with my friend Amanda with as much as possible, but she's so busy these days that. Uh, you know, uh, you know, even her, like, we're always talking about, yeah, yeah, we got to do this. She's like, yeah, yeah, we got to, you know, she'd be like, Reg, we got to, we got to start jamming again. But it's just like, you know, like she, she's, so, she's a business owner. She's got two boys, you know, like, so she's got life to, to, to deal with it. But I told her about some of the songs that I wrote and stuff like that. And I haven't really played that many of them for, but there's one I got, I, I got that I'm still in the, the midst of writing this one. When I pull it off, and I pull it off live, it's going to be very, very epic. Uh, it's called White Whale, and I would really like to have a female voice on there because it would give it that kind of really eerie, kind of siren, you know, mythological siren sound, uh, kind of ghostly kind of feel to it, and that I think it would just blow people's minds, right? But the song, it's like, the, the, the lyrics were like five minutes. Uh, it was kind of like the song is a metaphor for a few things and I won't get into that but you could kind of sum it up as it, it's like a song about like Captain Ahab and obsession right and white whale from Moby Dick right and and the lyrics are pretty dark and whatever and I'm doing some pretty 
dark things chord wise and stuff like that but there's a lot of little medleys in between so the song itself is going to be probably about eight or ten minutes long by the time i got it the way i want it uh but the the chorus line in it is very melody based and that melody is going to haunt you and it's going to that's what's going to keep people coming back to listen to it right so it's one of those songs when i get it right it's actually not that complicated of a song but it's about putting things in the right place and once you do that again it's not really following any sort of formula because uh, i find also too when you write with an acoustic versus writing with an electric guitar you tend to write differently as well uh, and if you're uh, a rock and roll player you're going to tend to write a different way than somebody who's like a pop singer or somebody who's like a, a metal guy us metal guys uh, you know like right now i don't have a lot of metal stuff out but as you start hearing more of my eight string stuff y you'll get the idea of like okay yeah well this guy's a metal guy uh because the the changes are different you know what i mean um going between uh you know different uh you know starting off on major chords and then going into like like the the uh the one i can't wait to show you again like be a month or two before you get to hear it but uh the the uh comet into supernova starts off with probably one of the most angelic chords you've ever heard before and i stole this chord from joe satry and he's always with me always with you it's that opening chord that he does in a pergio i don't pick it that way just so it's not obvious but i do it on the eight string and i get that extra low b and it's a b it's a 13th chord or something I, I, I have to think of what that chord actually is but it's a it's a b it's a b major something right <laughs> it's a b major something and um that chord is really t tricky to play but i do it into it goes from the b to the d and uh it's a really or b to the e anyway it doesn't matter but anyway the way you hear it it, it gets it almost sounds angelic like okay and then the song takes a, a turn into kind of like a it's still major chords type of thing uh and there's a little bit you know metal like medley melody kind of things in there okay and then all of a sudden it turns really dark really quick uh into an arpeggiated kind of uh e my uh uh sorry f uh f sharp minor kind of sound and uh it goes on to an, uh, a, a string of arpeggios from there and it's goes from like i say like this really angelic kind of sound to that now when you hear this it's going to sound very unique now when i do this live even if i'm just up on the stage with my eight string i almost can guarantee I, i'm pretty sure you know you, you can say that not everybody's going to enjoy your performances live i i know that but i can almost guarantee that it's going to catch people off guard and they're going to say well i've never heard something quite like this before you know and when they hear this it's going to take them on a journey into something really incredibly crazy and then near the end of it uh while they're watching this guy you know just imagine yourself watching this uh the guy's got the guy being me there you know somebody some stranger is going to be in the audience watching this guy on stage with an eight string and then all of a sudden he starts singing he, you know like this operatic thing right at the end and it gets really dramatic and crazy and and then it ends on this really dark eerie kind of you know like the, the melody i'll give away the melody at the end is dun, 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 like that kind of a thing right um and it's it's it, it i know that's going to resonate with people i know that's a good tune because i like it and even if you know i know taste is subjective but I know that if I play that every time I've been playing it for the last past couple of weeks or whatever uh, it's something that hey this is going to be a good song for me this is something that I want to play live it's a song that when I've done it I'm not just going to forget about it and whatever put it to a side because 99% of the probably thousand songs that I've probably written I've probably forgotten about because it's just the, you know they either a don't resonate that well or it's like okay yeah that's good but you know if i never hear it again whatever but when it's a song that you really want to hear again it's like okay it's either a fun or b it's like uh, uh, the story's like hooking you 
uh, with the white whale song, the story is going to hook people. Uh, with the uh, you know comedy to supernova, it's the guitar is going to hook you. The the guitar is the song. The, you know, and then the the dramatic vocals at the end is just like the kind of like the sprinkles on it, the icing on the cake. So it just it just adds a dynamic. Now, if there was a whole when there's a whole band behind, there's probably going to be keyboards. There's going to be whatever. But I I'm actually thinking sometimes less is more. So just more a bass the a bass player, a guitar player, and the drums whatever and maybe keyboard you know to fill in some dramatic or even just leave that out altogether and just the vocals you know like like again you can do like power trio stuff uh the reason why i bring this up is that it's when we're writing our songs okay you got to write stuff that you like first right and then when you are done writing that first song okay even if you don't think the song is complete whatever put it aside whatever keep working on it and then one day you're just going to pick up and say i'm going to play it this way maybe you say you take a song and you write it you kind of like it you're not sure change the key you, you know like may, maybe go from a minor key to a major key or somewhere in between uh you know grab the old good old-fashioned circle of fifths and post it on your wall to see what your relative keys are maybe uh you do uh, if you want to if you want to see a uh, great songwriting uh, and I'll just finish up on this is go check out Night Wishes Elan a ghost a ghost love score for sure but Elan the key change in that at the end brilliant uh, but anyway that, that's a bit of a topic there for you so hope you guys enjoyed that video so I don't know if it would be helpful or not but something interesting anyway so if you like this kind of content all links are down below to help support the channel thank you so much to everybody who has next step rate subscribe share comment like I look forward to show, showing you some of this music in the very hopefully near future and uh, next to that, uh, be true to yourself, be true to others, always, always do the right thing. Have yourselves a great day. Eh?